Hello, my name is Tyler Koski. I'm a neurosurgeon with Northwestern Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. And we're here today to talk about exploring pediatric and adult applications of posterior bands. Our faculty for this discussion will be Dr. Patrick Segru from Advocate Medical Group, also here in Chicago, and Dr. Yashar Javadan from the University of California Davis Medical Center in California. They will be discussing the Versatile system, which in the past you've likely heard about the Versatile system in a distributed loading type scenario. Today's episode is going to be focusing on adult and pediatric patients using this very versatile system in some very complex pathologies. Hopefully you'll get quite a bit out of our episode today and see some applications where this product can really advance your patient care. Great, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. I appreciate um, the opportunity to do this uh, today. So I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, first my experience with banding and uh, in, in using Virtutai to provide a soft landing and, and to try and offload some of the transition from a rigid construct to a, a more mobile part of the spine. And I think it works great in that sense. And the, the reason that it does that I think is unique to Versati has to do with the tensioning mechanism. The quality of the tether you know, is certainly very good, but it has to do, I think, a lot with the tensioning mechanism that can, can do a kind of a controlled segmental uh, tension on the tether itself. And so when it comes to using a technology like that for one application, you kind of start to think about what other ways can we use it. And my kind of task in this in this episode is to is to go over a few ways perhaps in which we can use uh, Versatile to provide additional fixation. And, I, and I, I look at this in kind of two forms. One is that the tether itself can help to provide fixation uh, in just holding the spine, in holding in a certain place, or adding additional rigidity or things like that. And we'll give some examples of that. The other then is, an, is a manner in which it can actually provide correction. And that's where that tensioning part of it comes in. And Yashar will talk a lot about that uh, in really an impressive way to provide correction of, of pretty significant deformity. So when it comes to some, you know, just fixation alone, you know, we've evolved over the years from sublaminar wires to hooks to, to pedicle screw fixation. And there's no question that the, the gold standard for fixation of the spine when able is to use pedicle screws. Now there are certain circumstances where you can't use pedicle screws for one reason or another, but the, there are limitations to when you can use it. There's limitations in terms of bone quality perhaps, there's limitations in terms of actual anatomy to, to create that fixation. But I think in a, in a lot of ways we can use things like versati or tethering to add some of that stability. An easy example is in uh, a fusion mass. When there may be abnormal anatomy, there may be previous surgery that has, has blown out the pedicle, there's a fusion mass that completely obscures your ability to get any kind of fixation, that's one example when you can create some type of uh, of a hole through the fusion mass or through the spinous process or, or fusion mass above the, above the uh, dura that allows you to then grip the spine in that way. And you can then fixate it to the spine. With that said, you can use it for, there's increasing data on the additional need for uh, stability or rigidity in certain parts of uh, in certain parts of, of the spine, whether it's across a three column osteotomy or whether it's across multiple posterior column osteotomies or whatever it may be, or even long construct high demand fusion. So uh, it's an area where you have to attach potentially an additional rod, potentially an additional, dia you know, a larger diameter rod to kind of your, your correcting rod to provide that additional rigidity, right? So, that's, a, that's another place where you can use something like Versify to add an additional rod to your existing rod to add some of that stiffness. Right? That's, a, that's a great overview on uh, comment, Patrick. Um, thank you. 
I've always had uh, sublaminar wires before I had Versatile as kind of a supplemental fixation or a plan B. Um, and um, the applications of it is uh, definitely um, uh, many and numerous in deformity surgery. One of my favorite applications is uh, at the end of a um, deformity when the quality of the bone is poor or you're doing a lot of correction and uh, when you have your reduction tower on and you start seeing that screw pull out one or two threads I just stop right there and I put a versatile um, under uh, the lamina and I pull that vertebral body up to the rod and protect that screw um, so rather than blow that screw out and have to go to just supplemental fixation, you can even prophylax that if you uh, use it early enough and you can back that screw up um, and, uh, b without it failing completely um, uh, with a versatile. So yeah, the applications are definitely numerous. I think in the adult population, um, in the setting of poor bone, that is an is a perfect application in my mind for something like Versify. Um, when and you know you're going to have to pull on that screw a little bit to get some correction. Uh, that, that you can you can add an area to help protect the overall fix, strength of the fixation and get the correction that you need. And kind of that is you know is a nice segue I think into the into the second uh, aspect of how I think this can be utilized is in correction, right? So uh, when you have multiple points of fixation, whether it's pedicle screws or sublaminar uh, tethers or whatever it may be, it allows you then to manipulate the spine. And I think, you know, certainly in the in the adult population, and certainly for, probably for the theatric population as well, reduction of spondylolisthesis, I'm going to say like a high grade spondy almost, you have to use a tremendous amount of force to effectively reduce that spondylolisthesis when necessary. And part of that certainly is good carpentry. It's not just pulling on the screw, obviously. Uh, but ultimately, I think there's, there's an application for it to help slowly and in a very controlled fashion reduce uh, a spondylolisthesis or other uh, applications, I think, is actually the closing of a pre-column osteotomy, right? So one of the things that that I don't like doing as much as I end up, that I have to sometimes, is say when you're closing a PSO, right? So, you know, it, you know, the indications for doing a PSO is kind of beyond the discussion of this, but it's in a rigid spine, right? So you've got essentially two fusion, fusion masses that you've essentially cut in a wedge that you now have to close and create lordosis, right? So the you certainly have fixation laterally, maybe traditional pedicle screws, maybe in-out-in type screws into the fusion mass, whatever it is. But one of the ways that I found is actually effective is, is again, using the fusion mass um, above uh, to create, you know, essentially an area where you can pass the tether and then tension it down to the rod. And so you can kind of, you know, because the tensioner allows you to do it in a very controlled fashion, what it then also allows you to do is to help start closing that osteotomy and allowing the, the, the screws that are in to translate on the rod as opposed to having to force them and then stress those screws. Typically at the end, you got to push on the screws anyway to try and fully close that osteotomy. But I think it does help to save some of the stress on those screws by tensioning it through the fusion mass. You can actually probably do it above and below if you really need to, uh, but I think it's a great way to help do that, particularly uh, in somebody who's got poor bone. And I think this, that, you know, that is the ideal patient for, for using something like this as supplemental fixation, is somebody who has uh, really poor bone or, or questionable bone that you don't want to stress those screws more than you have to. Uh, Patrick, that's a good point too, that um, big advantage of the uh, of the Versatile tether is the fact that it has a, um, a flat surface with a good amount of surface area. So in 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 the days where we're using the sublaminar wires and you tension that the wire has the ability to cut out of bone, uh, but you know with the Versatile tether, 
Um, it's a nice flat surface and uh, it doesn't cut, cut out as easily. And because of the tensioner, you have the ability to kind of dial it in. And if you uh, see the poor, uh, the bone not tolerating the tension, you can kind of back off and fix it over there. And if it's tolerating, you can pull more and uh, you're not gonna cut out that wire and, um, and then you have to redo the a whole tether, the um, sublaminar um, <clears throat> fixation again with another uh, wire. Yeah, I think um, you know. I think what probably demonstrates that best, right, is, is some of the some of your experience with uh, using multiple tethers, using Versatile at multiple levels in, in in a very challenging patient, a challenging situation that that provides just excellent correction. So I don't know if you want to go through some of that at this point, but I think this is probably a great uh, place to demonstrate the power of Versatile in that setting. Yeah, absolutely, and then. We can jump into a case example. We have a patient who's uh, 17 years old and has a um, deformity in both the coronal and uh, sagittal plane, um, kind of apex at the thoracolumbar junction. Um, just uh, for um, being complete, um, this is a scoliosis in uh, setting of uh, uh, a syndrome, so it's a syndromic scoliosis um, and, um, and neuromuscular in nature. Um, as you can see, the unique thing about the patient has a large deformity uh, in a neuromuscular setting, but he's an ambulatory patient. So a little bit of a unique case where there are considerations for fusion levels, whether to fuse to the pelvis or not. And uh, we can touch upon that again, but the, again, to remember majority of neuromuscular, large neuromuscular curves are going to be fixed to the pelvis. However, in this patient, um, we indicated a shorter fusion sparing the pelvis because the patient was an ambulator. Uh, so it puts a, it put a challenge uh, before us because uh, we're going with a shorter construct. Uh, we want to balance this patient out with and good, good, get good correction. Um, and, um, and then we have, um, you know, all the issues that neuromuscular uh, patients have. Um, as uh, you can see, the two x-rays um, show a little bit of the flexibility of the curve. There's some flexibility in the coronal and sagittal um, uh, profiles. Again, we lay the patient supine so that uh, the kyphosis corrects a bit. And on the um, next slide, you can um, kind of see the uh, patient as um, they're ambulating. They um, have a little bit of compromise in their coronal balance, but they're still um, ambulatory at this stage. So we go to the surgical slide. Um, the uh, use of um, the Versatile technique um, is demonstrated um, uh, very beautifully by the fact that we could um, get our fixations proximally and distally after we do our uh, wide um, uh, posterior column resection osteotomies. Um, and um, for the portion of the curve, and uh, again, just to note, this patient's already in uh, halofemoral traction. So this is as, as good as this curve is gonna look uh, with releases and with traction. Uh, and at that point, we lay um, essentially straight rods uh, connecting the proximal and distal portion. Um, and um, the apex of that curve, and I believe there are five versatile um, <clears throat> over there uh, that are passed um, sublaminarly. Uh, and then gradually with all the towers on there, uh, we translated um, the apex of that curve into the rod. Um, uh, until um, uh, we felt like we had a good amount of correction. Uh, and what that assures us is that this patient is already coronally well aligned because the proximal and the distal end of the rods on a straight rod, the patient was already uh, well aligned. And um, it obviated the fact of us um, doing a, a osteotomy or a VCR um, you know, it's gentler on the cord, um, and uh, you know we're, we're we haven't um, 
we don't have to shorten or lengthen the canal, um, um, the spinal cord um, that much. Um, and uh, also, uh, we don't have to get uh, complete correction in this patient as long as um, the patient uh, is uh, well aligned and also obviates the fact of putting a very um, uh, uh, rotated screws into the smallest pedicles over there at the apex. Um, we got very good robust fixation um, and it saves us a lot of time. Um, you can imagine we just put some screws proximal and distal and then the, the versatile bands in the middle uh, brought the apex and, and we're done. And then you could uh, look at the uh, um, post-op um, uh, images. And as you can see over there, uh, especially on the uh, AP uh, x-ray, um, as you can see, the curve is not fully corrected, it's partially corrected, but the um, uh, coronal uh, alignment is acceptable. The head is over the pelvis um, and, um, <clears throat> and the patient um, overall had a good alignment on the next x-ray. You could uh, look at the pre-op and the uh, post-op next to each other. So overall, uh, good uh, coronal uh, and sagittal alignment for this patient and clinically also um, the um, rib hump, um, rib prominence was uh, corrected and this was without uh, cutting any of the ribs or um, doing a thoracoplasty. Um, yeah, so it even um, uh, helps you in the derotation uh, once applied uh, correctly. I mean, you're sure this is a beautiful case. Um, I think the results kind of speak for themselves there, particularly. I mean, x rays look great in the, in the clinical photos, I think look even better, right? I mean, that's just, I'm sure he's, he's very happy with that correction. It's kind of a few questions on the, on the technique side. So, when you cut your, your, your posterior column osteotomies, is that enough, or do you have to do any more additional laminectomy to, to pass the tether safely? Uh, and then, you know, I guess, do you always correct from the concavity? Do you try and get any correction with the convexity first, uh, and then kind of derotate towards the um, towards the concavity? How do you do it, kind of step by step? Um, kind of take us through it a little bit, if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the next uh, X-ray uh, to the right, you can see that. Uh, we've done a full posterior column osteotomies or something sometimes we call them ponte osteotomies where the um, uh, the facets were completely resected the uh, <coughs> spinous processes and as you can see over there we uh, left the lamina um, over here and that gives us a uh, very good access uh, for a sublaminar uh, uh, versatile uh, under that um, and to your point, you know, in neuromuscular scoliosis, again, they do come in a lot of different flavors, but they're usually a big sweeping curve. Uh, they're very stiff and the um, apex um, uh, is, uh, is translated um, kind of in the middle of the curve. So if, if, the, if this patient needed a, a pelvic fixation, you know, we would obviously have our uh, iliac bolts with uh, uh, iliolumbar construct, and then I, again, I would leave those rods um, straight, and then I would use a cantilever bending uh, to bring it um, to um, the uh, proximal screws, and then that would still leave a big apex, and I would bring it together with a versatile. And you know, we did this exactly the same way with a little bit of a shorter construct. We just had lumbar fixation and thoracic fixation. Uh, we laid the rods. Um, in a uh, straight, uh, and that left a large um, curve. So I initially put my distal, um, uh, I put the rods in distally, and I let the rods kind of um, be straight. And with two big rod holders, I take the uh, rods and I translate it um, to the proximal screws. Um, and um, with uh, some of the um, um, reline clips, I capture the uh, the rods down to the screws. Um, and then at that point, um, I have my versatiles all passed at the apex. And at that point, I can put my towers and gently translate uh, that apex uh, of the curve. And as you mentioned, I, I do it in the concavity because it just uh, makes sense to pull 
elliptic curve um, to the center, uh, to the straight rod. Yeah, I think that's a tremendous technique. Now, how do you, when you are deciding between uh, using maybe a short or, or small pedicle screw versus versatile, I mean, even in the setting of having something like navigation or something like that to try and help you get some fixation, how do you decide versatile versus pedicle fixation there? All right, that's a great question. So um, again, in this in the translation technique, um, I usually um, try to get um, at least you, around eight points of fixation, six to eight points of fixation, proximally and distally, and then I translate um, the rest of the curve in the middle uh, using the versatile technique to bring it over. Um, and you can imagine if if you have uh, if you put screws in the whole curve over there, you either had to uh, bend your rod uh, and go with a, a little bit of a, a gentle bend in the rod for a partial correction, and then you would have to fine tune that to get good coronal alignment to have the head over the pelvis. Uh, so this takes a little bit of the guessing game out for me because I, I laid a flat rod proximally and distally and all I had to do is bring that apex in. Um, uh, or you would have to um, uh, loosen the spine a little bit more and that would probably take a VCR. Um, and you know, that's again, very doable. Uh, but again, this, and with this technique, the, the blood loss is uh, significantly less. Uh, I'm not messing around uh, with the cord as much. Um, it, again, you, you could have issues with it, but uh, I think um, that the issues are a lot less uh, when you're avoiding the osteotomy and, and the whole thing that just moves along a lot faster. You know, it kind of becomes more of a um, single or a double major curve in an AIS patient rather than this stiff, big neuromuscular curve that then you have to uh, kind of deal with the whole day. No, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it sounds like it is, um, you know, it's it's an extremely uh, efficient way to get that correction, right? You've got fixation above and below to kind of tweak some of the, you know, the shoulder, uh, you know, height and things like that if you want, or, or, or push down on the pelvis, whatever you want to do if needed for, if you're going down or low, but you've gotten the perfect kind of uh, concavity correction that if you want, it looks great. Um, do you always use uh, five? Do you try and use whatever it needs, given the kind of how sharp or angular the curve is? Is there a minimum number that you'll use? And I guess for that matter, how do you reduce them? Do you do them one at a time or a little bit each time and then kind of keep going sequentially? How do you do it? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, it ends up being somewhere between seven to five. It depends on how, uh, you know, we kind of how big the apex is and how much you're translating over. Um, and uh, to your point, so I, I pass all the versatile um, under the lamina and, uh, and then I put the, um, the towers, all of them at the same time. And um, kind of like when we reduce the towers um, and we reduce the screws into the rod, I do the same with the versatile when you have multiple points of fixation rather than compromise one. I kind of gently go up and down and translate that whole uh, apex in. And then you can see it's, it's a pretty powerful tool. And um, I would probably say that, for example, in this patient, um, you know, using five sublaminar wires probably had uh, um, equal, if not greater pulling strength than I would have had with the screws that I could have gone into those settings. Sure. Yeah, I know that man looks, looks tremendous. As I'm looking at it, one of the other kind of applications I was thinking of would be, um, I don't know how often you use the temporary uh, convexity compression, you know, as, you know, certainly for like a double major curve or something where you're, you know, you got to look at both, you're kind of working on both. Um, and sometimes, you know, I've used uh, hooks in a rod to distract on the, on the concavity when needed in a temporary fashion um and you know i think using you know versatile to compress on the, on the convexity 
to even get some temporary correction there, maybe an additional application for Versatile, you know, in a setting probably more appropriate in, in, a, in an AIS type curve, something a little more flexible. I think it would be hard um, to kind of get a big segment like that to move it all in the setting of a real stiff neuromuscular curve. But another potential option, do you, have you ever, do you ever use any temporary compression or distraction and, and thought about doing type or something like that? You know, that, that's a really good point. I um, honestly, when I started using this technique, it was um, initially as a kind of a temporary um, construct to try to pull um, that curve in. And then it kind of um, morphed into just leaving the versatile as the main fixation. Um, um, so yes, um, certain times I, uh, I might put one or two versatiles and try to translate something that's stiff or I'm not able to get it, um, and use it as a kind of a temporary, uh, fixation for sure. And, um, you know, I'm, I ended up leaving those because, you know, it's just supplemental fixation at that point. Sure. Sure. Yeah, certainly in the, in the, in the, um, you know, in the in adult degenerative population too, I think, Versatile adds, you know, you know, if you look at it as, you know, we talked a little bit about supplemental fixation for correction that's already done. Um, and then your technique you described here is, is just an excellent description there for how to actually use it to create correct correction. Um, and I think the, 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 the holding correction is another um, way that versatile can be used, right? In the setting of, um, you know, the fusion rate in, in the pediatric spine is so high for the most part, neuromuscular may be a little different, but the AIS population is very high. I think, you know, for, for adults, it's, it's variable on a lot of different factors. Uh, and I, and pseudoarthrosis is a problem no matter what, uh, but pseudoarthrosis with loss of correction is a real problem. I think, and I, and I think one of the other kind of applications for Versatile is in maintaining your correction, right? So uh, whether that's providing, you know, tension on, the, on, on a convexity, whether that's providing tension in, in a lordotic setting, uh, we, you know, again, we've talked about it in, you know, uh, in previous episodes for, you know, for softening the landing, right? All it's trying to do is really generate some lordosis or transition some of that lordosis a bit even using it mid construct or distal construct i think uh can be helpful to kind of maintain that without having to add additional compression on a screw or things like that right where you can just kind of dial in some of that lordosis so right. um another another potential application for versatile in that setting i mean i think on the whole that kind of um you know, kind of covers the different applications uh, for uh, for Versatile from my perspective. I think, you know, kind of in summary of that, the, the key of it is I, I think that the ability for that tether to be passed comfortably uh, and controlled, but then also the tensioner are kind of the key of it. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but I think the two elements of it in that setting are what make it so useful uh, for all these different applications. Uh, that with controlled tension that you can provide at a segmental level is really what sets it apart. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, again, in a, um, in, uh, for surgeons that tackle uh, complex deformity cases, uh, you know, we have uh, lots of tools in our toolboxes. Um, and this definitely um, is uh, one of my top ones. Um, to be able to um, kind of go to plan B for a lot of things like the supplemental fixation. Um, and, um, you know, it uh, kind of obviates the use of any sublaminar wires at this point for me because uh, it's just superior in, uh, in its performance. Um, and um, in the technique that we saw, uh, I kind of use it as a primary technique uh, for my correction and as part of the construct at this point. So, uh, again, very versatile. So uh, for all the young surgeons and the guys that are uh, starting to do deformity, it's a, it's a great tool to have and um, be available there for you. 
Thank you all very much for your attention to our webinar tonight. Hopefully you got quite a bit out of that and enjoyed this excellent presentation. This is the conclusion of a series of episodes discussing the Versatile system. Hopefully you can see how versatile the system can be and many ways in which it can be incorporated into your practice. I particularly enjoyed tonight's webinar uh, discussing the uh, various aspects of the Versatile system that I can utilize for fixation, uh, whether it as, a, it as a primary fixation point or really as a supplemental fixation, trying to augment your screw system and you can really see the powerful translation techniques that you can apply with such a system. Hopefully you will see many opportunities to use this very unique and versatile system in your own practice.